So, Salamis part two, the actual battle. Go learn about this vital battle. Many historians, this is an extremely vital battle in their top ten most important battles in world history. To understand the arguments over the battle, what, what happened, what didn't happen, how important it is, etc., etc. And look at some sources, Herodotus as usual. Trireme, Ram, bow stern, the back of the ship. So the, the front of the ship, the back of the ship. The bow is the front of a ship, the stern is the back. Front, back. Marines, soldiers who fight on ships are marines. A melee, a big confused fight is a melee. Confused, Artemisia, Phoenicians, decapitate. If you decapitate somebody, you cut their heads off. Decisive, really important. Decisive, it makes the decision on one or the other. Right, dispositions. A disposition in military terms is how you organize your forces before the battle, your disp disposition. So, as you can see here, the Persians line up like this. Big long line, Ionian Greeks here, Phoenicians at that end. Opposite them, a mile and a half, two miles away, are the Greeks. Athenians, Corinthians, Aegean, that's the thing, Spartans here, lined up opposite them. So that's the disposition of the two uh, fleets. There's an Egyptian contingent, an Egyptian fleet, and they don't take part in the battle. Uh, even though at the earlier, in an earlier battle, uh, Artemisia made me very effective, they weren't at this one because they were sent this one. What seems to have happened is that just uh, show you here, hopefully. The Egyptians were sent this way to block the channel here, whilst the rest of the Persians were here. So the, the Egyptian fleet actually doesn't take part in the battle. So those are our dispositions before the battle takes place. Tactical maneuvers. Well, as you know from the picture we've seen before, the Phoenicians don't have room for all this business here. This long curves, you know, curved runs, smashing people at the stern, their deep plus and periplus. There's not enough room for all this business. And instead, what the Greeks do is that they back water. They go backwards at first, back towards Salamis. And they are hoping, they are hoping the Persians follow them. They want the Persians as close to Salamis as possible before they can attack them. So they go forward and then go back, a feigned retreat, like the Spartans of the Mopoli, trying to get the Persians, the Phoenicians rather, to come after them. Then, according to Rodidus, read it in the, in the text, there's some supernatural rubbish. He says, as all this is going on, ghosts appear, spirit women appear in the Greek ship, shouting at them, when are you going to start fighting? When are you going to attack? Why are you backing off so much? Attack! Uh, yeah, rubbish. And the battle starts. The Greeks dart forward to attack them. It's very confused. Herodotus does not give us a particularly good explanation of what goes on and exactly how they fight. Is it ramming? Is it boarding? Is it a bit of both? Who attacks when? It's all very confused. He does, however, give us some individual uh, accounts of fighting. He mentions Queen Artemisia. He mentions her quite a lot. He mentions the particular fight she gets involved in. She is in the middle of this battle, according to this, gone quite badly. An Athenian ship Looks like it's got her cornered. And she has no room to manoeuvre. Her ship has no room to manoeuvre. There's another Persian ship in the way. So what does she do? She rams the other Persian ship and sinks it in order to get her so she can escape. Her, her Xerxes is watching all this from the shore and makes a mistake. He thinks she's done something brilliant. She must have, she must have destroyed a, a, an Athenian ship and exclaims, my men have become women, and my women have become men. 
So that's Artemisia. It actually rams one of her own ships to get away. Another famous example, and we've seen it in the picture we've used several times. Phoenicians, who were doing quite badly in the battle, rock up to see Xerxes, who's watching it, complaining the Ionians have betrayed them. At the very moment, this Ionian ship rams an Athenian ship and starts to sink it. As that happens, another Greek ship smashes into the side of them. But it's okay, because they bravely capture the ship that's just rammed them. You can see them here swarming on. So instead of being useless and betraying them, they've sunk one ship and captured another. Xerxes sees all this, and there's the Phoenicians accusing them of being cowards and betraying them. So what you do, he has the Phoenicians' heads cut off there and then. So, battle's finished. Approximately, we think Herodotus says, a couple of hundred ships are sunk, many more damaged. Approximately 40 Athenian ships damaged or captured. So a clear victory for the Athenians. The Persian fleet is forced out of the Salamis Straits. Lots of it damaged, a lot of it sunk. So what Xerxes is going to do now? Well, he's not going to give the whole thing up. That's for certain. He decides he's going to send the fleet back to uh, the Persian Empire. He's going to take himself back to Persia with uh, part of the army. But he's going to leave the best soldiers he's got. He's going to leave his elite behind. He leaves Mardonius in command. With, he says to Mardonius, you pick whichever blokes you want to keep. Mardonius picks an elite, approximately a 100,000 man force. Apparently he picks them by armor. Anybody who wears body armor, you've got a chance against the Greeks on picking you, plus some uh, elite cavalry. So for example, he picks the Egyptian Marines because they wear heavy body armor, according to Herodotus. And then Xerxes toddles off back to the Persian Empire, never to be seen in Europe again. But the war is not over.